The following sermon by Jonathan Edwards is called The Torments of Hell Are Exceedingly Great. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, Have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Luke 16, verse 24. The occasion of Christ speaking this parable of the rich man and Lazarus was this. He had been warning his disciples in the hearing of the Pharisees against covetousness, that they should not set their hearts upon riches. He told them that they could not serve God and mammon is in the thirteenth verse. Now the Pharisees, as we are told in the fourteenth verse, who were covetous, derided him. They were the guilty persons, and they could not bear such doctrine. Now Christ speaks this parable to show them further the vanity of riches and how that men may be very rich and yet exceeding miserable. As he shows here in an instance of a rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day, who died and went to hell and was there extremely miserable and tormented. When a poor beggar that lay at his gate full of sores in a miserable loathsome condition that desire to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table, and was looked upon not too good to be a companion for the rich man's dogs, when he died was carried by angels to heaven into Abraham's bosom as a true son of Abraham. We have an account also of the rich man seeing of that happy condition of the poor man that he so condemned, and how he expressed himself when he found himself in such a condition, and saw the happiness of Lazarus and what was answered to him. We are not to take this as a proper history of any two particular persons that once were in the world, but only a representation of what happens very often in the world, how the rich and great that wear purple and scarlet and fare sumptuously go to hell into the lowest misery, while those poor men that they disdain and used to look upon no better than dogs went to everlasting blessedness. Our text is part of that that the rich man said upon a scene of Lazarus in glory. Where I would particularly take notice of the expressions here are of the greatness of his misery in the first place, number one. His crying to be helped by Lazarus shows the greatness of his misery. He that lived in such a state and fared so sumptuously when he was upon earth is now brought to cry for help by him that was a beggar at his gate that sat loathsome and filthy and despised amongst his dogs, begging some crumbs such as his dogs used to eat. His torment is such that his proud heart is now brought to it to be a beggar, to beg relief from him that before begged crumbs of him. Number two, the greatness of his misery appears in that he directly says he was tormented. Number three, the manner of his torment shows the greatness of it. I am tormented in this flame. We can hardly have a sense of any more dreadful sort of torment than being tormented in a flame, to be all encompassed on every side with flames, to be scorched and roasted in a fire. Number four, the greatness of his torment appears by the things that he begs. Tis but a drop of water. He is in such pain in the tormenting flames that he longs for one drop of water. If it should be granted him, it would be but a very small mitigation of his torment. What great manner of good would it do a man to let fall a drop of water on him when he is roasting all over in a fire? It will give him but very little ease. But yet he begs and pleads only for this. He would be glad if he might have but the least mitigation. A man in torment would be glad of one moment's rest. They'd give anything for the abatement of one stroke. Those in hell, if they thought there was any hope of obtaining it, would beg for one drop of water to cool but one little spot of their tormented bodies, though it be but for a moment. The water would afford but a little ease while it lasted. It would be presently gone, and then torment would be in the same degree as before. Number five, the greatness of his torment appears by the particular use he desired to have the water applied to, and that was to cool his tongue, which shows that he was tormented in every part. There were not only flames without by which his body was encompassed, but there were flames within him. 
he breathed flames. His vitals were all on fire, and his tongue was all inflamed. Every part was full of fire, full of wrath. He was pierced through and through with those flames. If he had said his hands were tormented with fire, or his feet, it would not have expressed so much torment as when he desires a drop of water to cool his tongue. It seems to show that inwardly in a flame that his bowels and his heart and his vitals were all on fire. Wherefore, the doctrine we propose to insist on at this time is this, that the torments of hell are exceeding great. There have been some of the free thinkers, as they call themselves, of the present age that have denied that the torments of hell are so great as they are generally pretended to be, that deride the common opinion of the greatness and extremity as if people were needlessly frighted about it. Some of them have written to this purpose, they are impatient of such a restraint upon their lusts. They devote themselves to their pleasures, and they can't bear to have their pleasure spoiled by those fears and checks of conscience which the expectation of such dismal torments would bring upon them. They therefore endeavor to make themselves and others believe that it is not so intolerable as many imagine. They make the misery of hell to consist principally in the punishment of loss. They shall be cast out of God's sight and shall not have God's favor as others shall. They shall lose the enjoyment of this world and the pleasures of heaven. And many that don't openly profess this do yet oftentimes secretly flatter themselves that it may be hell is not so dreadful a place as ministers pretend it is. They hope that if they do go to hell, they shall find some way to bear it. Sometimes they argue that God would not go to torment a poor creature to such a dreadful degree, or perhaps flatter themselves that they shall be the better able to bear it when they are used to it, or that they shall have a great deal of company, and they shall be able to bear it as well as others. Wicked men have many contrivances to ease and quiet their consciences, and do the more easily believe those things that they have a mind to believe, and so by endeavoring to escape the affliction of the fear of hell, they plunge themselves into the infinitely greater affliction of enduring it. They flatter themselves whatever they can that they are not in so great a danger of hell, and thereby damn themselves and make the devil the more sure of them. And they flatter themselves that if they do go to hell, they shall not find it so intolerable, and thereby take courage to embolden themselves in sin, and so to make it the more intolerable. It is therefore a thing highly needful that men should be convinced that the manner is as it really is, that if hell torments be very dreadful, they should be sensible of it, that they may be the more careful to avoid them. It is therefore my design to endeavor to prove that the misery of hell is indeed extremely great by the following arguments. Number one, it is wrath without mercy. That alone is an evidence of it, that it is the unmixed wrath of the great God. The punishment that is threatened to be inflicted on ungodly men is the wrath of God. God has often said that he will pour out his wrath upon the wicked. The wicked, they treasure up wrath, they are vessels of wrath, and they shall drink of the cup of God's wrath that is poured out without mixture. Revelation 14 verse 10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. That is, there shall be no mixture of mercy. There shall be no sort of mitigation or moderation. God sometimes executes judgments upon sinners in this world, but it is with great mixtures of mercy and with restraint. But then there will be full and unmixed wrath. Job 27.22 For God shall cast upon him and not spare. Here let us but consider how dreadful this will argue the punishment of hell to be. Let it be considered that God is infinitely great and that we are nothing and less than nothing before him. He fills heaven and earth with his presence and the heaven of heavens cannot contain him. We are less than the least insect in his hands. He is a God of infinite highness and majesty. The mighty kings of the earth, they are but as little worms before him. He is an almighty being. His strength is such that he created the world by the word of his power, and he can shake it all to pieces if he pleases, or to turn it to nothing in a moment by a word. Speaking. How dreadful must the unmixed, unrestrained wrath of such a being be when it is poured out upon a worm? 
We are told that the wrath of a king is as a roaring of a lion. Kings, if they will execute wrath without mercy, are able to make men exceeding miserable. They can inflict dismal torment, but what is this to the wrath of such a being? God is in a manner the only being. He is, and there is none else. Other things are nothing compared to him. He is the first, and he is the last. He is from whom all things are, he for whom all things are, and he that governs all things. He that upholds all things every moment. He that feels all things, in whom all live and move and have their being. How dreadful will it be to be the object of the eternal wrath of such a being. His wrath without mixture, to be the mark of his fury who is all in all. Here possibly it may be objected that though God's wrath be a thing in itself so dreadful, yet it may be poured out in a small proportion, and that God's judgments in this world are called his wrath, that yet sometimes are not more dreadful than the effects of the wrath of kings. To that it may be answered that temporal judgments are called wrath, as they are forerunners of wrath, they are foretastes of it. But they are not God's full and unrestrained wrath as the torments of hell. God does, as it were, keep back his wrath here and moderates and restrains it. Psalm 78, verse 38. He did not stir up all his wrath. God's anger in this world is qualified with abundance of mercy, but hereafter he will give his wrath full scope. He will, as it were, rise up out of his seat to execute vengeance. As we argue justly that when God sets himself to show mercy and to be gracious, he will be gracious like a God, so when he sets himself to execute wrath, he will be angry like a God. It is not any restrained, moderated degree of anger, because it is often called God's fury, as if he were enraged, so it is called his fierceness, Revelation 19, verse 15, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. It appears that God will execute his wrath to a very great degree upon sinners because it is said, His wrath shall smoke against them. Deuteronomy 29, verse 18, 19, and 20. Lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe, bless himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of mine heart to add drunkenness to thirst. The Lord will not spare him, but then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man. How dreadful, therefore, must a case of that person be that will have the mighty God thus rise up in such fierceness and fury against him, and that he shall cause his anger to smoke against. Let us consider the matter a little. What does it imply and how miserable, inexpressibly miserable, must the condition of such an one be? The scripture uses the same way of arguing to prove the dreadfulness of God's anger from the greatness of his being and majesty and power, and therefore we may be sure the argument is good. Psalm 90 verse 11, Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. According to thy fear, that is according to thy awful majesty and greatness, those fearful attributes. The psalmist argues here from the greatness of God's majesty that the power of his anger is so great that we can't conceive of it. Ezekiel 22:14. Can thine heart endure, or can thine hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with thee? Where the argument is plainly this, that seeing it is God who shall deal with them, therefore their punishment will be intolerable. Again, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 9. The Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Where there is evidently an argument implied that the punishment and destruction of unbelievers will be exceeding dreadful, because it comes from the presence of the Lord and because it is inflicted by such mighty power. Again, there is the same argument very plain in Hebrews 10, verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And I will mention one place more, and that is in the second psalm at the twelfth verse. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. 
Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Where it is implied that if the son be but a little angry, it will be exceeding dreadful. Blessed are they that put their trust in him, implying that if it were kindled a great deal, it would be much more inconceivably dreadful. Argument 2. The damnation of ungodly men is appointed for that very end to show the greatness of God's power and jealousy. And therefore we may argue that this misery will be exceeding great. As God appointed the blessedness of the saints to show forth the exceeding greatness of his mercy and love, so the damnation of the wicked is to show the exceeding dreadfulness of his anger. The majesty of the sovereign of the world consists much in the dreadfulness of his displeasure. The majesty of a king consists much in the greatness of his authority, but his authority can't be great except it be a dreadful thing to displease him. But God will show his majesty and authority to be immeasurably greater than kings, both by his favors being far more desirable and his angers being far more dreadful. God has appointed the punishment of the wicked for the sin to show what the anger of God is and how great his majesty and supreme authority is. It is God's glory that he is a jealous God as well as that he is an infinitely gracious God. When Moses desired to see God's glory and God answered him by proclaiming his glory, they were both in his mercy and grace and also his jealousy. His name that he proclaimed to Moses consisted of them two things. Exodus 34, 6 And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. And then in the next verse, that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children, unto the third and to the fourth generation. It is God's glory that he is a consuming fire, and he has appointed the damnation of the wicked on purpose to show forth this glory of his, as the scripture expressly teaches us, Romans 9, verse 22. What if God, willing to show his wrath, and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? It is a dreadful text. In the first place, we are here told that the end of their punishment is to show God's wrath, that is, on purpose to make known how dreadful the wrath of God is, and secondly, to make his power known. God shows the greatness of his power and strength in the punishment of the wicked. He shows what an almighty God can do when his wrath and fury is stirred up. To the same purpose is that place in Second Thessalonians 1 verse 9. The wicked shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, which implies that God will glorify his power and strength in the destruction of the wicked. In that four-sided place in the ninth of Romans, we are told of two ends of God's damning wicked men. One is that he may show his wrath and make his power known in their destruction, and the other is, as it follows in the next verse, in the 28th verse, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. That is, God shows the dreadfulness of his majesty and anger in the destruction of the wicked in the sight of the godly, that the godly may thereby become the happier by knowing better the riches of his glory. For when they see how dreadful God's anger is, that will make them sensible of the worth of his favor, and will make them prize it exceedingly. This argues also that the torments of the damned will be exceeding great. Argument 3. Expression used to set it forth is that this misery will be the perfect destruction of the creature. It is always so represented. In Job 20 it is said that the wicked shall perish forever like his own dung. And it is compared to God's tearing of them in pieces. Psalm 50 verse 22. Now consider this, all ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. In several places the wicked are compared to the stubble and to briars and thorns before the flames, that are easily and utterly consumed, Matthew 3, verse 10. Therefore every tree which brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. They shall not only be cut down, because that is not utter destruction, but they shall be cast into the fire and burnt up. Psalm 37.20 But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. 
they shall consume, into smoke shall they consume away. These similitudes hold forth no less than the perfect destruction of the creature. It is called a grinding to powder. Matthew 21, verse 44. And whosoever shall fall on the stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. What a dreadful idea does it give of the destruction of a person to have a rock fall down out of heaven upon one and dash him to pieces or grind him to powder. Devoted cities were to be perfectly destroyed, men, women, children, cattle, and so on, and be a heap forever which typified their perfect and eternal destruction. Perfect destruction must be understood in the same sense as we say perfect happiness. The perfect happiness of the creature is so much happiness as to feel the creature's capacity as much as the nature of the creature, while it has no larger capacity, is capable of receiving. So that is perfect destruction, when the creature has as much misery as the nature with such a capacity can receive. As the vessels of mercy are to be filled up to the brim with God's love and with happiness, so the vessels of wrath are to be filled up to the brim with God's wrath and with misery. This is not a straining of at all beyond the proper meaning of those places that speak of the utter destruction and absolute ruin of the sinner. Argument 4. From the defects of wicked men I argue thus, this least sin deserves eternal destruction, both according to the law of God and according to the reason and nature of things. The law fixes death as the wages of every sin. And the day that thou eatest, thou shalt surely die, which does not only refer to that one particular sin, but to every other thing that God has forbidden. Romans 6, verse 23. The wages of sin is death, but by death is meant no other than the utter eternal destruction of the creature, not only the death of the body, but the death of the soul. Not only transient death, but continuing eternal death. Again it is written in Deuteronomy 27, verse 26, Cursed be every one that continueth not in all things written in the book of the law to do them. So that if a man commits but one sin, and does but in one article disobey God, he deserves to be cursed of God, which is no other than to be devoted to eternal destruction. The nature and reason of things will also evince the same, for rebellion against God's authority and contempt of his majesty, which every sin contains, is an infinite evil, because it has that infinite aggravation of being against an infinitely excellent and glorious majesty and most absolute authority. A sin against a more excellent being is doubtless greater than against a less excellent, and therefore, sins against one infinite in majesty, authority, and excellency must be infinite in aggravation, and so deserves not a finite but an infinite punishment, which can be only by its being infinite in duration. And then one sin deserves that the punishment should be to that degree of intenseness as to be the destruction of the sinner because every sin is an act of hostility, and it is fit that God's enemies should be destroyed. If every sin, therefore, though comparatively small, deserves eternal death and destruction, how dreadful then is the deserved punishment of wicked men, whose hearts are full of sin, full of inveterate, implacable enmity to God, and all that is good, and set upon all manner of evil, whose very natures are full of sin as a tripe is full of poison, and who have lived all their days in sinful practices, who have committed sin continually as constantly as they have rose and lay down, or eat or drank, yea, from whom sin has flowed as continually as water from a spring, Jeremiah 6, verse 7, who have every day been thinking of known sins that have disobeyed God to his face time after time incessantly, have every day cast contempt upon God's power, upon his justice and holiness, and affronted his majesty, and slighted his mercy, have stopped their ears to commands, to calls and warnings, and instead of growing better, have grown worse and worse. The more God commands and calls, who have committed many great sins, have grossly transgressed his holy law. If one sin deserves eternal death, and all sin will be punished as it deserves, as most certainly it will, how many thousand deaths and destructions will be heaped up upon the souls of wicked men? How dreadful will be their misery, he who must die a thousand deaths at once and die a thousand deaths to all eternity? 
Argument 5. The metaphors and similitudes that the scripture makes use of to signify it do signify an extreme degree of torment. It is called the bottomless pit, Revelation 9.1, and many other places of the Revelation. Not that there is literally any such thing as a pit without a bottom, but the deepness of the pit signifies the lowness of the misery. It seems to signify both the immense and unfathomable degree of misery, for to fall or to be cast down or to be depressed exceeding low or into a deep pit. In scripture phrase always signifies misery. Hell, therefore, seems to be called a bottomless pit because the misery is inconceivably great. And another thing that is probably signified by it is the eternity of them, that there is no end to them as there is no end or bottom to the bottomless pit. Again, this misery is called the blackness of darkness, Jude 13, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Darkness in the scripture very commonly is put to signify misery. Therefore, the blackness of darkness signifies perfect misery, the most extreme degree of it. It seems as if the apostle wanted an expression to signify how great the darkness was, and so he called it the blackness of darkness. It is a Hebrew way of expression. The Song of Songs is the most excellent song, and so the darkness of darkness is the greatest darkness in the world. Another metaphor that is used to express this torment is a worm that never dies, Mark 9:44, where their worm dieth not. It is taken from Isaiah 66:24, and they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worm shall not die. The expression of the worms not dying and the carcasses of those men alludes to this. When a dead carcass lies upon the face of the earth till it begins to putrefy, it will presently be overrun with worms. The carcass will be filled within and without with worms gnawing upon it. And the expression of their fires not being quenched alludes to the custom of the heathens, when any of them died, to burn them in a fire and so entomb their ashes. Now the prophet says their worms shall not die. When a dead carcass lies putrefying upon the earth, after a while the carcass will be consumed and the worm will die. But the worms that shall gnaw upon the carcasses of those men shall not die. That is, their souls shall always be tormented. The similitude holds forth exceeding misery. How miserable must a man be to be alive and yet have his flesh and bowels and vitals all filled with worms, continually gnawing upon his body as they do upon a dead carcass. But the principal metaphor made use of to signify it is that of fire, which is used here in this place and the most commonly used of any through the whole Bible. The future punishment of the wicked is always represented by their being cast into a fire, into everlasting burning, into hell fire, a fire that never shall be quenched, as it is in our text. The rich man cries out that he is tormented in a flame, that he wants a drop of water to cool his tongue. Let us consider how great misery would it be to be always burning and roasting in a fire, and yet never to be able to die, yea, to have the senses preserved in every part of the body in their utmost quickness, their feeling not to be at all dulled by the fire. This would be a vastly greater torment than for a man to be burnt alive, because the fire presently sears his flesh and weakens the life, and dulls the sense, but in hell they shall have sense in an exquisite degree. They shall have no other end but to bear torment. But as the scriptures represents the manner, this fire is not any fire of an ordinary degree of heat, but it is a furnace of fire, Matthew 13, verse 42, and shall cast him into the furnace of fire. Furnaces are made for the dissolving and refining of metals and such like uses that require an excessive degree of heat. How miserable would be a little venomous worm lying forever in such a furnace and yet full of quick sense. Hell is also called a lake of fire, Revelation 20, verse 15. And so whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. A lake of liquid fire, like burning brimstone or melted metal. What an expression of misery is this, to be plunged into such a burning lake and there to lie forever. Again, it is compared 
to a fiery oven. Psalm 21, 8 and 9. Thine hand shall find out all thine enemies. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. Thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of thine anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire shall devour them. Possibly it may be objected against the force of this argument from the metaphors of Scripture, that sometimes the Scripture uses metaphors, that if they should be taken in an equality to the literal sense, it would carry the matter beyond the strict truth, as sometimes when the Scripture only speaks of a temporal destruction, it uses such metaphors. To this I answer that the metaphors of Scripture, when they are used about temporal things, often are hyperboles, and they literally express more than is intended. But the metaphors that are used about another world, they fall short of the truth. The reason is, then, when the Scripture uses metaphors and similitudes about temporal things, it only does it for the beauty of expression, and oftentimes taken literally, they express more than is intended because they allude to some spiritual thing that the temporal thing was the image of. Thus the bondage of the children of Israel in Egypt is called the iron furnace, not because it was so dreadful, but because it was a type of hell. And so many glorious metaphors were used about the land of Canaan that have taken literally, went beyond the truth, and it was because Canaan was a type of heaven. So many glorious expressions that are in the prophets about the deliverance of God's people out of the Babylonish captivity that were vastly beyond the literal truth, but it was because this was a type of the redemption of Jesus Christ. But when metaphors are used in Scripture about spiritual things, the things of another world, they fall short of the literal truth. For though things are the ultimum, the very highest things that are aimed at by all metaphors and similitudes, and the Scripture uses similitudes about those things for quite another reason, and that is because there is a want of words to express them in any other way, Thus hell is compared to a furnace of fire and to a lake of fire because the greatness of the torments can't be expressed by any other way than by similitudes. God's aim when he tells us about hell is not to set it out with uncertain metaphors and similitudes, but really to let us know what hell is. It is unreasonable to think any other thing, but it is very evident that the similitudes of Scripture fall short rather than go beyond with respect to the things of another world, because we are told that they are so great that we can't conceive of them. As it is said of heaven that its happiness is so great the eye hasn't seen, nor ear heard, nor heart conceived, and as the Apostle Paul says, it was impossible to utter it, Second Corinthians 12.4, by which it appears that heaven goes beyond the thoughts and expressions that are used about it. For the same reason we may conclude that it is so with respect to hell especially seeing we are expressly told so, Psalm 90, verse 11, Who knoweth the power of thine anger? That is, it is impossible to know or conceive of it in this world, so that we may very rationally conclude that the similitudes as they are used in Scripture about hell don't go beyond the truth, that metaphors of fire will probably be no metaphor after the resurrection. Argument 6 we may argue the greatness of this torment from their expressions of their misery who were the subjects of it. We have in Scripture some representation how the wicked will express their sense of misery, both at the expectation and approaches of God's wrath and also in the enduring of it. We may see how the sinners in Zion express themselves when in expectation of this misery. Isaiah 33, verse 14. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness is surprise to hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? They are sensible that they cannot bear it, that it will be altogether intolerable. They cry out as those that are amazed at the very thoughts of it. As it is said, fearfulness has surprised them. Again in the sixth of Revelation at the fifteenth and sixteenth verses, how that the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? They have such a terror and the fears of approaching wrath, they would be glad of such a remedy if they could but 
but be hid. They would be glad if they might have mountains and rocks with all their weight falling on them. And it is not only women and children that are thus terrified, nor is it only the mean and low and ignorant, but it is kings of the earth and the great men and rich men, men that used to look upon themselves as a sort of God, were heard and honored amongst men, whose displeasure was dreaded, and it may be used to make nations to tremble. These are now seen in caves of the mountains, crying for the mountains to fall on them. They are not only the cowardly that are thus terrified, but the chief captains and the mighty, them who used to head armies with undaunted courage and resolution, that did not fear the face of the enemy, that have made their enemies to tremble and used to triumph over them. These are now seen running and hiding themselves in dens and wishing for rocks to fall on them and cover them from the wrath of God. Them that have been most mighty and powerful on earth will then be as weak as other men, and as stout as hearted will be made to tremble and stagger under the divine vengeance. We have also here some account how the damned will express their misery when they are actually enduring by weeping and welding and mourning and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 8 verse 12, Matthew 13 verse 42. Christ makes use of such words as signify the greatest expressions of misery. They shall weep and wail. There shall be the bitterest lamentations, the dolefulest groans and cries, and not only so, but they will gnash their teeth as in the utmost extremity of anguish. And we have a particular instance in one text of a rich man's crying for a drop of water to cool his tongue. Argument 7. I argue that the misery of hell will be extremely great from the types and images of it. First, temporal death is but the image and shadow of it. Death is looked upon generally as being the greatest disaster that can befall a man in this world. What is there that men are so afraid and have such a terrible sense of as they have of death? It is justly called the king of terrors, Job 18, verse 14. With sorrow and affliction will not men rather suffer than death. Skin for skin, and all that a man hath will he give for his life. Death is very awful and terrible in its circumstances, in its forerunners, concomitments and consequence. The pains, languishing, the groans and convulsions that go before it are awful, and it is dreadful and shocking to nature to see the nature break and their dying pains gasping and catching for breath, the eyes fixing and the countenance changed with pale death and its consequence have an awful aspect. The body is laid in the dark and silent ground, and there putrefies and rots, becomes exceeding loathsome and filthy. It is awful to think of it. It is very emphatically and lively set forth, Job 10, 21, and 22. Before I go, whence I shall not return, even to the land of darkness and the shadow of death. A land of darkness is darkness itself, and of the shadow of death, without any order, and where the light is, is darkness. But however, this is but the shadow of eternal misery. They are both called death in the scripture, not because they are anything of the same nature one with another, but because one is the shadow of the other, as is very common in scripture. So heaven is called a temple, not because it is a thing of the same nature as a temple, but because the temple was an image and shadow of it. And temporal death is often in scripture made use of as a type of eternal misery. But if the very shadow be so awful and terrible, how dreadful is the substance, as the types of the Old Testament fall infinitely below the substance, the sacrifice is below the sacrifice of Christ, the tabernacle and temple below heaven, so does temporal death below eternal. Temporal death is contained in the curse and contained in the threatenings, thou shalt surely die, but scarcely is a part of that death but rather as an image of it, because it is said the saints shall not die, John 11:26. Whoso believeth on me shall never die. From whence I argue that temporal death, when compared with eternal, is not worthy of the name, that it is looked upon by Jesus Christ who knew to be no death at all and nothing but the image and shadow. The substance exceeds the shadow in both these respects. It exceeds it in degree of dreadfulness and misery and then in duration. Temporal death is a transient thing. A man is but a little while under the agonies of it. But eternal death is a continual thing. They are always dying. It is not only as bad as to die a thousand times or ten thousand, but it is a dying all the while forever. If a man were to be to all eternity under the same agonies, which he is under in the moment of death, it would be but an image of hell. 
Number two, another image or shadow of hell that argues the greatness of its torment is the valley of the son of Hinnom. For hell in the New Testament is taken from the name of this valley. This valley is called Tophet often in the Old Testament. In the 30th of Isaiah, at the 33rd verse, speaking of Tophet, reference seems to be had to hell. For Tophet is ordained of old, yea, for the king it is prepared. He has made it deep and large. The pile thereof is fire and much wood. The breath of the Lord like a stream of brimstone doth kindle it. In idolatrous times they were wont to burn their children in that valley of Hinnom. The manner of burning them with either in a brick kiln or in hollow brass heated over a fire. Either as an image or type of hell gives a dreadful idea of hell torments. The fire of a brick kiln is of a most fierce and glowing heat. How dismal would be a man's torment if he could subsist alive and sensible, shut up in the fire of a brick kiln. That type is very much like the similitude of a furnace of fire to which the scripture compares hell. The other way of burning children in the valley of the son of Hinnom, by shutting of them up in hollow brass over a fire, and so scalding them to death, exhibits succeeding great torment and misery. And we are to remember that these things are but types and shadows, and therefore doubtless fall far short of the thing typified. If being burnt alive in a brick kiln or scorched to death in a hollow brass be but a shadow, what must be the substance? Is this not the way of arguing natural and conclusive? Thirdly, another type of hell that shows the greatness of his misery is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, God's raining fire and brimstone down from heaven to the destruction of those wicked cities, represented his pouring out his fiery wrath upon ungodly men in another world. The deliverance of Lot out of Sodom was typical of the saving of God's people from hell, and a future punishment of the wicked is expressly compared to such a destruction as was that of Sodom and Gomorrah, or raining fire and brimstone upon them in a burning tempest. Psalm 11.6 Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire, and brimstone, and an horrible tempest, or it might have been rendered burning tempest, as it is in the margin and singing psalms. This shall be the portion of their cup. This seems to allude to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, but whether it does or not, the punishment here spoken of is the same. But what we would learn is exceeding evident by Jude 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Why is the fire by which Sodom and Gomorrah were burnt called eternal fire? For the fire soon ceased when it destroyed those cities, but because it was a type of eternal fire. Now when the destruction of Sodom is said to be by the raining of brimstone and fire out of heaven, it seems to have been by miraculous thunder and lightning. The fire of lightning is brimstone and fire, or the burning of a sulfurous manner. It is probable, therefore, that they were destroyed by thick and perpetual flashes of lightning and claps of thunder. It is a way of dying that nature has a peculiar horror of. And what a dreadful picture does it give us of the destruction of hell that it shall be like perpetual flashes of lightning with amazing claps of thunder upon the heads of the wicked, piercing their souls through and through. Is hell as Sodom was, all full of nothing but fire and brimstone, continual incessant peals of thunder and glaring flashing flashes of lightning upon everyone's head, in everyone's face, and through everyone's heart, and that without any cessation, which they shall feel to the utmost, and yet live to feel more? It shall not be as when anyone is killed by lightning in this world, he is killed in a moment, and neither hears nor perhaps feels anything, or if he does, it is but for a moment. But in hell they shall feel it all. They shall feel the dismal pain and rending of soul that it will cause, and that without ceasing. And it will not be one flash of lightning, and then an intermission, and another by and by, but the lightning will be one perpetual glare and all in the same soul. The fire of lightning is exceedingly hotter than any other fire that we have opportunity to observe, instantly dissolving the hardest metals, and therein it is a fit type of the fire of hell. Therefore, the fire of hell is so often compared to fire and brimstone to signify the extraordinary fierceness of it. 
Argument 8 from the sufferings of the martyrs. The torments that many of them have undergone argue the exceeding greatness of the torments of the damned. I take my argument from that place in 1 Peter 4 from the 16th verse. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin in us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly in the sinner appear? The apostle is here speaking of the sufferings of Christians, and from thence he argues that seeing their sufferings are so great, that the sufferings of the wicked must be incomparably greater. If judgment begins with them, where shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? If they are scarcely saved, that is saved after so much suffering, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? Now that we may see how far this argument will carry us, we must consider what grievous pains and tortures many of the martyrs have undergone. And history gives us an account of no sort of men that have been so cruelly tormented, and that men have shown so much invention and contrivance in tormenting as they have Christians. The wit of men and of devils seems to have been set on work to find out tortures for them. It has been a common sort of death to burn them alive. But their adversaries have not been contented with that. They have contrived gradually to scorch them to death, have roasted them alive by a gentle fire, have broiled them alive upon a gridiron, have set them naked in iron chains, heated red hot, have tied the living to the dead mouth to mouth, and so have let them lie till they have died, have plucked off their flesh from their bones with burning hot pincers. They have had their nails tore off from their fingers. One had his nose and ears and cheeks cut off, and then burnt with red-hot irons till he died. Another was taken and was often stabbed in the soles of his feet with a dagger, and after that had parts of his body cut off and seared with a lighted candle to stay the bleeding, and then was dragged through the streets on the ground, and then had a cord twisted so hard about his head that his brains flew out. The legs of some they put in iron boots filled with oil, set them not afire till the flesh came from the bone. Many have been thrown to wild beasts, and many baited to death with dogs, and thousands of other torments have God's people been exercised with. Such trials that God in his providence ordered them in the world, though they were very dear to him. How dreadful then must be the future torments of those that God hates, and that he will give over to devils to be tormented by them, and they shall have no mercy either from them or from God or from any creature. Although the sufferings of God's people are sometimes so great, yet the apostle argues that they are not so great in comparison as the miseries of the ungodly. And surely the argument is very plain and clear. God's people are those that have all their sins pardoned. They are those that are dear to him who governs the world. They are the members of Christ's body, of his flesh, and of his bone, those that he laid down his life for, and those that he every day remembers. And if they sometimes suffer such extremity that it fills a mind with horrors only to think of, what then will become of them that are accursed? What indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish will they endure that obey not the gospel? Application Inference. Hence we may infer that the happiness and joys of heaven are also exceeding great. Our state in this world is a middle state between those extremes of blessedness and misery, as it is proper that a state of probation should be, and without doubt the extreme of happiness is as far above this middle state as the extreme of misery is below it. It is at least as much God's design to glorify his mercy and love as his jealousy and justice, for God is love, and he will make known the exceeding riches of his grace, and the exceeding greatness of the ocean of his goodness to the vessels of mercy before prepared unto glory. There are none that knows the power of God's anger, so the length and breadth and depth and height of the love of God passes knowledge. Eye is not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it ever entered into the heart of man what things God has prepared for them that love him. And God will make known his power in the greatness of the misery of the damned, so he will no less glorify his power in the greatness of his people's happiness and the exalted heights of joy which he will give them. We argue that the misery of the damned will be exceeding great because it is unmixed, unrestrained wrath of the great God, who is infinite being, before whom all other things are less than nothing. 
So we may argue that the blessedness of the saints will be exceeding great because it is the unmixed, unveiled, and unrestrainedly manifested love of the same great God. As we argue that the misery of the damned will doubtless be great because their punishment was ordained for this very end to demonstrate the awful majesty of God and the greatness of his jealousy and dreadfulness of his displeasure, in the same manner we may argue the greatness of the saints' blessedness as being what was ordained on purpose to demonstrate how excellent and desirable the love of a God is, and how abundant his grace. The favor of princes is much desired and greatly valued, but God will show how far his favor and love excels it. When he manifests his love, he will act like a God. He will show how blessed they are whom he chooses to cause to approach him, and what a glorious thing it is to be taken into the embraces of divine love. As a punishment of the ungodly will be the utter perfect destruction of the creature, so the reward of the saints will be the perfect blessedness of the creature. And as we argue from the desert of the sin of wicked men that their punishment will be exceeding great, so we may argue from the merit of the righteousness of Jesus Christ that the happiness of the saints will be great. For how greatly may we conclude, will God reward the obedience of so glorious a person as the Son of God of infinite excellency, especially seeing his obedience was attained with so great temptations, and his work was so exceeding hard. The infinite Son of God did not come down from heaven and subject himself to the law, and appear in the form of a servant for nothing. No, he shall see of the travail of his soul, he shall see the fruit of his labors. As the greatness of the misery of hell appears in that temporal death with all its awful circumstances, is but an image of it. So temporal life is but an image of eternal life. Life is the most precious of our enjoyments in this world. But that, with all its enjoyments, is but the shadow of eternal glory in heaven. As the metaphors and similitudes of Scripture hold forth the greatness of the misery of hell, so those metaphors that are used about heaven do also show the greatness of its happiness. It is there often compared to a crown and kingdom, to a glorious city, to a delightful garden to a feast and banquet, to rivers of pleasure, to light, to the brightness of the sun, and everything that is in this world that appears beautiful, glorious, and excellent, is made use of to show forth the happiness of the saints. The types of scripture do also show the greatness of this happiness, as well as the greatness of the contrast, misery, particularly Solomon's temple, which was so exceeding magnificent and beautiful, yea, by the holy of holies of that temple, and the sufferings of the martyrs as they argue the greatness of the misery of the wicked, so they do more directly argue the exceeding great future happiness of the saints. For we may conclude that seeing the saints are so dear to God, and so nearly united to Jesus Christ, that God would never order it so in providence that they should endure such sufferings, if he did not intend to bestow upon them a happiness in the other world, that those sufferings are nothing in comparison of. The apostle calls them light afflictions as great as they are, that is, light in comparison of their future happiness, and tells us that they work out a far more exceeding weight of glory, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 10. Application to Unawakened Sinners Awaken them and set them upon earnestly seeking safety. How dreadful, sirs, is your condition! Such of you as are condemned to those torments. It is a very awful consideration that there should be any in the world condemned to such misery. We should think so if we had not been hardened to it by hearing of it so often. If it were not a common thing with us to hear that multitudes go to hell, if it were a new thing it would frighten us to hear and be assured that there was one man in the world that was in such a condition that he was condemned to such misery as we have now heard of. How much more frightful should it be to you to think that you are the person, you are the very man that is condemned to this, that you are now and are every day when you sleep and when you wake in a damnable state, that you belong to hell, are an heir of those everlasting tortures and torments that you have heard of, are in such a condition that if you should happen to die in it, would inevitably go directly into this misery. Be entreated to consider your own condition. Take a little view of your own circumstances. Look before and behind. Consider a little what it is to be condemned to hell whether it be a dreadful thing or whether it is not. Why should you be more senseless than a beast, more senseless than an ox or an ass, more senseless than an ant? 
Why should not the exceeding greatness of this misery be sufficient to awaken you? If this misery be so extremely great, then it is proportionably terrible. And if you act reasonably, you should be proportionably afraid of it and terrified with the danger of it. The danger of being slain, of having our natural lives taken away, is terrible, and it does terrify men exceedingly. The danger of falling into the hands of cruel enemies that will probably torture us to death is more terrible. And why then is not the danger of enduring that misery that is so great as we have heard the torments of hell to be proportionably more dreadful? And why is it then that you have no more dread upon your mind about it, not so much as to hinder your being secure and quiet and indolent, not so much as to put you upon any industrious endeavors to escape, and not so much as to keep you from running yourself more and more into danger knowingly and wittingly? There are certain arguments that a man is not very sensible of danger, yea, but very little terrified about it, that it is not enough so terrified to make him willing to be at any considerable pain in endeavoring to escape, when there is a possibility and especially a probable opportunity of escape, and much more when he is not enough concerned about his danger to escape from a daily needless endangering himself more and more. Men, if they are only in danger about their estates and about their good names and about all their worldly interests, will bestir themselves. Men don't need preaching to make them sensible of these dangers, and it is only about the dangers of hell that infinitely exceeds all that men are like stocks and stones and movable that are talked to and preached to, make them bestir themselves in vain. Why should there not be any other motive? But what you have heard proved under the doctrine, namely the extremity of these torments together with your being in a state of condemnation to them, be motive enough to make you set about seeking deliverance. What greater motive can there be? If what men are told of the dreadfulness of hell and God's word won't arouse them, what will? Would it do if somebody that had been in hell and left it should rise and tell them about them? Should express by words and actions the dismalness of them? This would be a very frightful thing to men, and very probably would set many men a-trembling at first, and it may be would not do that if it were not a new, unusual, strange thing. We know not what hardness and stupidity there is in the children of men. If we were not used to it, we should think that for God to tell of such a thing would be enough to awaken men, and it would seem to us to have such tendency to awaken, to have God tell us from heaven what it is, as to have a creature come from hell and tell us. It is God's wrath, and God knows better what it is than the damned do, and can tell us better. And surely his authority is as good as one of theirs would be. But the case is truly as Abraham in the parable says, Luke 16:29 and 30. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. But I shall proceed a little further to put you in mind of some other things relating to your danger of hell that will awaken you if you are not exceeding stupid. Number one, it is very uncertain whether ever you will be saved from hell or not. You are hitherto not so much as awakened. You have taken no step towards an escape, so that it is exceeding uncertain whether ever you will escape or no. You think with yourself when you hear these dreadful things about hell that you'll never come there, but yet there are more that are in the same circumstances that you are in, and under the same supposed probabilities of escape that never do escape, than that do. If you really thought that you should go to hell, you would be frightened, but you flatter yourself that you shall some way or other find means to escape, and yet you live in the neglect of means. You flatter yourself unreasonably, Think to escape hell by means, and yet use no means. You think it may be, that though you don't use means now, yet you intend to before long. But for all your intentions, it is exceeding uncertain whether you will ever escape hell. If you have some hope because you have pious parents, yet for all that, it is exceeding uncertain. If you think you are yet young and in health, and hope you shall live a great while, yet for all that too, it is very uncertain. If you have no greater probabilities to lay hold on than these that you shall escape going to hell, a prudent man would not venture sixpence upon such probabilities. Those that are still unawakened sinners and are not in the use of means to escape hell, 
for all their supposed probabilities of escape in hell, it is more probable as to anything that appears to them that they will go to hell than that they will not, because there are more such abundantly who do go to hell than do not. Consider that if you do go to hell, hell is certainly near. How near, you can't tell. But in a general, that it is near, you may be certain. If you should live fifty years longer, how soon will they be gone? How soon is the revolution of the year finished, and how soon are fifty of them numbered? It would terrify you if you knew you were to be burnt at the stake or roasted to death by the Indians fifty years from now. It would appear near to you. You would be ready to count the months and the days, but what is that to the being cast into hell, into that place of extreme torments that we have been telling you of, at the end of fifty years? Whether the time of life appears short to you now or not, when you are come to the end of it, then it will appear short to you. When you are entered eternity, then your life will appear as the scripture says. It is as a vapor that continues for a little while and then vanishes away. But you know not how suddenly you may be cast into hell, Psalm 73:18. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places, thou casts them down into destruction, 2 Peter 3:10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, and the wish to heaven shall pass away with a great noise. And the element shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Number three. Consider that if you don't bestir yourself to escape hell torments, you make them greater and greater. Every day you are continually adding, you heap up wrath. Are they not great enough already that you must go on adding to them, further increasing the wrath of God against you? Though every degree of hell torments be very great, yet there are numberless degrees in proportion to man's sin and wickedness. Though if you should go to hell this night, your misery would be to the very great extremity, Yet if you continue in sin longer and still neglect the means of your salvation and should go to hell at last, your torment would be still greater. God is able to make miserable to what degree he pleases. There are no limits can be set to possible torment. They that are in hell would be glad of any mitigation. They would not only be glad they'd be quite delivered, but they would be glad to have their torment made a little less. They would be glad to be abated, though it were but the punishment of one sin, of one rash word or sinful thought, as appears by the rich man's begging for one drop of water to cool him. Therefore, don't go on to increase hell torments for yourself. Number four. Consider that if once you get into hell, you'll never get out. If you should unexpectedly one of these days drop in there, you must be there. There would be no remedy. They that go there return no more. Consider how dreadful it will be to suffer such an extremity of torment forever. It is dreadful beyond expression to suffer at half an hour. The misery, the tribulation, and anguish that is endured. Do therefore but consider what it would be to suffer day after day, to have no rest day nor night for thousands, for millions of years, yea, forever and ever. They will despair of ever being delivered. That despair will double their torment, yea, more than double it. If a person that had the headache or toothache or any other such pain, and knew he was to have it all his lifetime, and not have a moment's rest, it would more than double the affliction, it would magnify it exceedingly. How much more are pains increase when the subject of them knows he shall endure them to all eternity? If a person knew they were to endure a pain all his lifetime, that would not be despair because there is an end, but there is utter despair that accompanies the torments of the damned. Application number two. We would apply this doctrine to warn sinners to avoid those ways that lead to hell. If you would not come to those extreme torments, you must not walk in those paths that lead to them. There is but one path that leads to heaven, but there are many that lead down to the bottomless pit. Beware, therefore, of those paths. Multitudes are going on in paths that lead directly to the chambers of death. I shall particularly mention some of them. First, a way of drunkenness most certainly leads to hell. There are many that are in this way. They are in the way to those great eternal torments that we have heard of. The Apostle tells us, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, that drunkards shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The same is said again in Galatians 5, 19, and 21. A man that continues in this way, and is not changed from this course till he dies, he assuredly goes to hell. When the scripture speaks of drunkards, it is not only them that drink, 
so as to bereave them of their reason and senses, are included, but all those who make a trade of drinking to excess, all those that addict themselves to that practice of drinking strong drink, that are under the government of the love of it, such as commonly haunt taverns and drinking houses, to that end must be included. The scripture must be its own interpreter, but there we find a drunkard and a wine-bibber are synonymous terms. It is evident that in the scripture a drunkard and a wine-bibber are the same thing by that place in Proverbs 23, 20, and 21. Be not amongst wine-bibbers, nor amongst riotous eaters of flesh, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty. Now the word wine-bibber is exactly the same as wine-drinker. Now doubtless the scripture means by wine-drinkers them that make a trade of drinking wine, or addict themselves to drinking strong drink, so that all tavern haunters will be included. Therefore, beware of this as a way that leads to eternal torments. Number two. Another way that leads directly to hell torments is a way of lasciviousness, a way of lascivious acting in various kinds and degrees and of lascivious speaking, yea, in a way of indulging lascivious thinking. Those that live in an unclean way, whether in company or alone, they are going to those torments that we have heard of. Such as go on in this way will before long have fire and brimstone rained upon them in a far more dreadful manner than it was upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Such souls as are possessed with such impure flames of sin, they are looked upon by God as fit for nothing else but the flames of hell. Such unclean souls are fit for no other place than the bottomless pit in the lake of fire, where all impurity shall one day be buried. 1 Corinthians 3.17 if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Some persons, if they don't commit the gross acts of uncleanness, flatter themselves that they don't much offend God. But know that the scripture doesn't bear with any unclean behavior as anything that savors of uncleanness. It bids us hate so much as the garment spotted with the flesh, and doesn't allow so much as an idle word or unclean thought. There is none that practice lasciviousness that shall inherit the kingdom of God, Galatians 5, 19 and 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Number three. Another way that leads to hell is a way of keeping bad company, that is, in associating with lewd, immoral, profane persons and being with them that are disorderly and vain in their conversation. I prove that this is a way to hell by the 13th of Proverbs at the 20th verse. A companion of fools shall be destroyed. Therefore, if you have addicted yourself to such company, you had best to forsake them. If you would not go to those terrible torments that have been proved, shall come upon all wicked men. That is all the motive that I shall propose to you to forsake them, that you shall be damned if you don't. Number four. A way of Sabbath breaking and of profaning God's worship is a sure way to hell. Is not this a common thing amongst us? Are there not many amongst us, especially young people, that have no regard to holy time, but in their talk and actions trample God's Sabbath underfoot and make no difference between holy time and other time? I think this may be taken for a rule that those moral evils that were capital according to the law of Moses, that at all times they are mortal damning sins, for God by ordering that they should be punished with death, signified that they led to destruction and eternal death. But the profaning the Sabbath was so to be capitally punished. In Exodus 31.14, we are told that he that defiles the Sabbath shall surely be put to death that shall shall be cut off from the congregation. They were to be stoned with stones, which sort of death seems to be appointed more especially to represent God's wrath poured upon the head of the sinner. And how many are there that not only profane the Sabbath, but profane God's public worship on the Sabbath by an irreverent, indecent, rude behavior? All such as make this a practice are going to hell. I need to offer no other place to prove it but the third commandment that God will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. I might mention many other ways to hell, such as covetousness, injustice, undutiful behavior to parents, contentions, which are commonly gone in. But so much may suffice for this time. End of sermon. That the torments of hell are exceeding great. Jonathan Edwards, 1703-1758. to 1758.